to end. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr David Ellier of Host Plus. Good morning. Could I ask whether you'd prefer to uh, take an oath or make an affirmation? Uh, oath, Mr Commissioner. Yes, perhaps if we could swear the witness, please. Please repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes, Mr Delaney. Thank you, Mr Commissioner. Uh, Mr Elliott, is your full name David Elliott? Correct. And is your business address 114 William Street, Melbourne, Victoria? That is correct. And are you the Chief Executive Officer and also Company Secretary of Host Plus Propriety Limited? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, have you received a summons to appear at this round of hearings of the Commission? Uh, yes, I have. And do you have the original summons with you? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, could I tender the summons, please? Exhibit 5.171, a summons to Mr Elliot. Thank you. And Mr Elliot, have you um, prepared a witness statement that responds to topics specified by the Commission in rubric 5-53? Uh, yes, I have. And do you have the original statement with you? Uh, yes, I do. And are the contents of the statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, could I tender the statement and the exhibits, Mr Commissioner? Exhibit 5.172, the witness date and exhibits of Mr Elliot in relation to rubric 5-53. Uh, and can I just ask, Mr Elliot, do you have a, an additional working copy of the witness statement and attachments? Uh, yes, with yes you? I do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr Commissioner. Thank you. Ms Diaz. <coughs> Mr Elliot, you've been CEO of Host Plus since 2003, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. And before that, you were the executive officer? Uh, I was uh, the executive officer, that's correct. Uh, in your statement, you refer to Host Plus's objectives to be the super fund of choice for people who live and love the hospitality, tourism, recreation, sport and related industries. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Host Plus is a, um, is a sector specific fund, uh, largely born out of um, the hospitality and tourism industries. Uh, and the trustee entity was originally established by the Australian Hotels Association and the United Voice Union, is that correct? And uh, United Voice today, but they were um, called a different union uh, at that time. Miscellaneous uh, Hospitality. Liquor Hospitality liquor, and Miscellaneous yeah, workers, Union. Workers Union, that is correct. And the fund has around $32 billion in funds under management, is that correct? It's approximately $34.5 billion. $34.5 um, is at uh, July. Thank you. Uh, and as at the end of May, Host Plus had about one million member accounts, is that correct? We're, we're actually at about one point, just over 1.1 million members. Uh, funds experienced extraordinary growth. And you say members, do you mean member accounts or members? I understand there's a slight discrepancy between the yeah, two. No, th these are actually members. members. So th these are members, 1.1 million members. Thank you. Now, that number, and I, I'll refer to member accounts here, yes. did decrease slightly between um, 2013 to 2016, but then increased by about 35,700 between June 2016 and June 2017, is that correct? Uh, that, that does sound approximately right, yes. And uh, this is in your statement at paragraph 14, if you yes. want to read. Thank you. And the average member balance, Mr Elliot, is that around $24,000, is that? It actually works out to just over $30,000 okay. as at uh, present day account balances. So we've got about $34 billion in funds under management, about 1.1 um, million members, so it works out to just over 30,000. 30, and the industry median is around 66,000. It's around half the industry average. I haven't checked it, but I'd, I'd presume that that would be correct. Okay. And the returns on the products offered by the fund, net of fees and taxes, are consistently high compared to the rest of the industry, is that correct? Uh, We'll, we'll go with consistently high. It has been one of the best performing funds for, for quite a long time. Um, it does currently occupy uh, first position over 1, 3, 5, 7, 15 and uh, 20 years as, as the number one best performing fund net of uh, investment fees. And, and the tax. My Super product, is that what you're referring to and there? The, that's the My Super th That's the My Super. That is the default product where the majority of our members currently reside. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to explore with you some of the features of the membership 
profile of Host Plus. Yes. Uh, as you said before, you, you explain in your statement that because the fund is for the hospitality, tourism, recreation and sports sectors, it has a large number of members that have only recently entered the workforce and are employed on a casual or part-time basis or who regularly change employment. Is that that's correct? Uh, yes, that's, uh, that's actually one of the features of, of the sector and the fund's largely been to some degree structured along those lines. And uh, is it correct to say most members come into the fund because their employment contract or award has the fund as a default fund? It is largely as a consequence of the default system that operates within the hospitality and tourism industry, that is correct. I see. Uh, or they are employed under an enterprise bargaining agreement that uh, the fund is an option in that or the only option in that? That, that is correct. Um, uh, there are quite numerous uh, enterprise agreements. Um, they would vary between union and non-union agreements. Um, and that does actually provide significant coverage in the industry as well. And you also point out in your statement that a large cohort have low account balances? Uh, yes, there would be a large cohort of members that do have small account uh, balances. They're typically very young members, so at the early stage of the accumulation phase of their working life. Okay. And, and that's really a symptom of the first feature that we described, <coughs> that the workers in this industry are coming in, they're new, they're working casually and maybe they're, they're young and in this sort of um, hospitality yeah, work. Yeah, typically part-time, uh, casual employees, if you can think about um, students uh, working their way um, to you know, subsidise their university life, uh, typically that's, uh, that's the type of age demographic that you would have. Thank you. Uh, I just want to take you to a couple of pages in your statement. Uh, your statement commences at WIT.0001 dot zero zero nine five dot triple zero one thank you uh, if we managed to put up on the screen triple zero <coughs> triple zero six and triple zero seven there are some tables there so that's page six and seven of your statement mr Elliot if you yes. have that yes I handy. Do. thank you uh, so the first table on the first page, that shows the number of member accounts with balances of less than 6000 or $6,000 or less. Is that correct, that first? Th that's the first. Uh, that's the th first that is, table. That's the first table, that's correct. Okay. And so we see there that uh, as at 30 June 2017, 469,659 member accounts had balances that were $6,000 or less. That's correct. Uh, and that figured that represents around half of the total as at that time? Uh, roughly at, half. At that time, it's just under 50% of the membership. That, that is correct. Thank you, Mr. Elliot. Uh, and the second table on page six, that shows the number of counts that are deemed inactive? Uh, yes, so inactive um, as defined uh, within the context of a uh, member hasn't received a contribution over a 12-month period. And we see there that 296,898 accounts are inactive. That's at the end of June last year. Uh, so total, we're talking about total inactives? Yes, yes. Total inactives. Can I just, sorry, that figure is from where? Where did you obtain that, that number? Can I just clarify that? 161. Oh, we're looking at the other, yes, that's yes. right. That's the other, over the page. But if we just start here, the number of member accounts deemed inactive within the fund set out in the following table, just a paragraph 20 there. So, so paragraph 20. Yes, um, what does that, that, that refer to there? That refers to the total, the total. inactive. Um, so every single member um, that hasn't received a contribution over a period of, of 12, months. 12 months. So it's the totality of the membership there. Yes, and is that also a symptom of what you were talking about before about the demographic of the fund, that maybe because the, these members are likely to change jobs regularly, they leave? Um, and are no longer tr contributing with that original employer that commenced the account with Host Plus? Um, it, it's largely typically um, individuals have actually made the decision to leave their money with Host Plus. We are a public offer fund as well, which means quite a number of um, members would have joined by virtue of simply wanting to keep their money there, uh, to take advantage of the investment performance of the fund or the insurance features of, of the fund but they're not contributing anymore when they're in that cohort. They haven't contributed. It doesn't mean that they won't contribute, but they haven't contributed. 
over that 12 month period, uh, which is when we actually um, cut those figures, cut those numbers. Okay. And if we go to that final table on that page, this is the total number of member accounts in the fund with the balances under 6,000. That's set out below, is that? That is correct, right? yes. So we, and we see there at the very bottom, as at 30 June 2017, the total that we were under 6,000 were 469,659. Uh, that is correct. So that's about half. Uh, it's yeah, just under half. Yeah, just under half. That's correct. Yes. Uh, and over the page, there's the table at paragraph 23. Actually, I'll go to 24. That's the number of inactive accounts that we talked about before with the balances under 6,000. Uh, yes, that, that's correct. And so we see there at the bottom corner, 161,037 uh, uh, have that total under 6,000. That, that is correct. And they're inactive. Uh, they haven't received a, a contribution over a period of, of 12, 12 months. months. Um, you can talk about engagement, but that they're inactive by virtue of having not received a contribution over that period of time. Yes. And so is that roughly around one-sixth of the accounts as at that time? Um, as, as at, yes, as at that time it would represent that, yes. And uh, the figure at the top of that column, the 33,467 accounts with the $350 or less. Yes. Uh, now, what happens with those? Are they rolled over into the ATO at some point or...? Um, so, uh, okay, ATO, ATO transfers and guidelines. Uh, there is a, a different criteria that is applied <coughs> with respect to transfers to the ATO. And from memory, um, the, the guidelines um, state that, um, firstly, the member needed to be a member of the fund uh, for at least two years and not received a contribution for five years, so not have received a contribution for five years. So it's a, it's a different criteria that would apply with respect to those members that would be identified as eligible to be rolled over to the ATO or to an eligible rollover fund, such as the OS fund. So a cohort of this figure may end up um, eligible to be rolled over into the ATO? If they do meet that, that, that specific criteria. criteria, that could be the case, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so just to sum up what we've been through, it's fair to say there's a large cohort of the fund or the members of the fund that have inactive accounts with small balances. Uh, yes, inactive accounts uh, measured over a 12-month period. Yes. Uh, and that demographic is, is different from other funds, isn't it, is it Mr Elliot? There's probably only one other fund that would probably have a similar demographic and that would probably be REST, which is a retail employees super fund. Um, again, typically very young people entering the workforce very, very early on in their careers. So that's probably um, the, the best comparison that I can think of. And the members that have the inactive accounts, uh, is it fair to say they're less likely to be engaged with their super? Uh, um, well, if they're, if, they're, if they're typical, um, if they're typical uh, of my children who are also engaged in the hospitality tourism industry, I think the answer to that is yes. And they may have even moved on to another employer who's started another account on their behalf. They're contributing to that because they've changed jobs. Yeah so, the, yeah, so the issue of multiple accounts, certainly in, in our industry, and I'm happy to, to talk a little bit more about that later if you like, but multiple accounts is certainly a key feature of, of the industry, certainly for young members, and to that extent, um, certainly uh, the Host Plus trustee undertakes a number of programs in order to um, try and um, unify uh, any multiple accounts that may be identified within the fund. Uh, now, it's a concern for Host Plus that it, it wants to attract and retain those members for scale reasons, is that that's correct? Uh, so scale is, is a very important part of um, the feature of, I think, any fund. Um, as you know, scale benefits um, ultimately feed through in terms of lower fees to the members and um, uh, better investment outcomes by virtue of the funds under management that that may actually attract. And if we turn to page four of your statement, I think that's triple zero four, you set out um, how the numbers have tracked from 2013 to 2017. And we see that, that the number of accounts has largely remained 
sort of oscillated around that one million mark, is that correct? Um, it has. Um, there are a number of features there in terms of transfers that actually did take, take place and I think we've um, I've included a statement with regard to that, ATO transfers, transfers to the um, uh, to the OS fund or loss of members in, in general to, to other funds, rollovers out. But it's largely stayed the same yes, over that period of time. Yes, it's very in about 30, 30 odd, 20 to 30 odd thousand, but it's largely remained relatively steady. And the funds under management or the value of assets in that table has almost doubled. Um, now, is that one thing is that that's largely due more recently to the, the Scott Pape effect. Can you explain to the Commissioner what that, what <laughs> yeah. that is? Um, we can't give Scott all the benefits. So one of the things that, that I have done is over the course of the last two years, um, so I've gone back to track the growth of the fund from the 1st of, um, 1st of July 2016. So I've looked at 16 uh, through to 17, 17 through to 18. The fund has actually grown by $14 billion, $14 billion over the course of the last two years. The Scott Pape effect, if we want to call it that, insofar as, um, from memory, I think Scott's book recommends um, our indexed balanced option, so that is not the default option. Uh, that accounts for about $2.5 billion. So if you, if you take out the Scott Pape effect in terms of funds under management, there's about $11.5 billion uh, of growth that's largely attributable to, well, it's attributable to a number of things. Um, investment performance, um, Host Plus for the year ending 30 June 2017, delivered uh, a rate of return, uh, I think was, we were the best performing fund of 13.2%. Uh, and then again, 30 June uh, this year, 30 June 2018, again, uh, number one best performing fund of 12.5%. Um, in addition to that, you've had uh, an increase, slight increase in the SG. You've also had extraordinary growth within the hospitality and tourism sector. Um, the sector itself is one of the fastest growing sectors in the industry. Uh, we've seen the, the rise and, and growth of uh, Chinese tourism. Um, I think we're now in excess of a million uh, tourists uh, that directly come from, from China. We're seeing a growth of tourism within um, uh, within India. So our industry, which is the hospitality and um, hospitality and tourism industry, has actually grown. As a, and as a consequence of that, um, we're seeing an unprecedented number of hotels being built, um, uh, restaurants. Um, the entire industry has actually exhibited an enormous amount of growth. I think from memory, the industry's grown by about 2%. Um, and it now accounts for uh, the total hospitality tourism ABS numbers are somewhere in the vicinity of about 680 to 700,000 employees. So by virtue of a lot of the retention programs, um, you know, we, we do spend enormous amount of time and effort in terms of retaining the default um, uh, superannuation arrangements that we have with um, our key employers or employers in general, uh, the growth of the industry, um, uh, the performance of the fund, they've all been positive contributors to the overall growth of the fund. So the growth of the fund, well one of the points picking up on what you've just said there is growth is largely driven by the existing employers, the organic growth of those employers. It, it, it is, it's, it is largely driven by that and again as, as I've highlighted, if we strip out the uh, Scott Pape effect, which again is largely reflected in the growth in the index balanced option, there's been phenomenal growth um, within our industry and clearly we are a national fund. Um, uh, we're a scheme that caters for the entire uh, hospitality and tourism industry across Australia. Uh, and conversely, less members have maybe joined, or less of the new members have joined from new business wins. From new business wins? New business wins, yes. Uh, no, we've, we've, well, we've had, I mean, a significant part of our growth does emanate from existing uh, employers or the existing membership. Um, a, a great example would be, um, I mean, Crown Casino, uh, I mean, they continue to grow as they build another hotel. The fund will effectively leverage off that growth. Um, we've seen new market entrants um, come, into, uh, come into Australia, particularly some of the hotel brands, some new hotel brands. Um, and that's, that seems to be an ongoing trend and, and one that will certainly continue. And uh, we're certainly 
keeping track of, of the growth within the hospitality tourism sector, particularly within the accommodation divisions that um, represent a large portion of, of our membership. Okay. So just to confirm that you, you've, you've said that a lot of the growth is coming from existing employers, and you mentioned Crown. Y yeah, yes. um, I mean, that's one example. We had, we had approximately 200,000 new members join the fund over the course of the financial year ending 30 June 2018. Um, for the financial year ending 30 June 2017, we had approximately 180,000 new members, uh, but we have lost, we then on average lose about 100,000 members, 80 to 100,000 members per year. So on balance, the growth of the fund has largely been net about 100,000 um, year on year. Thank you. Um, now I just want to explore the, the ways that HostPlus tries to retain and attract members. Uh, one of the things that HostPlus does is uh, it does communicate with members to stop them having their balance rolled over into the ATO where they are a lost member. Uh, you're aware that there, there are regulations around this that require accounts with less than 6,000 where the member's uncontactable and inactive a lost account to be paid to the ATO. You're aware of that? Uh, yes, so there are certain steps that um, the trustee, uh, I think the ATO um, best practice guidelines do clearly set out uh, an obligation on the part of the trustee to do whatever they possibly can in order to engage and ensure that the member is given every opportunity to um, reactivate or at least be contactable insofar as the fund is concerned. So, so there, is, there is a program of works which the trustee does undertake because it fundamentally believes that members, to the extent that they are engaged and can reactivate their, their accounts either with Host Plus or transfer that money to any of their active accounts, that it, it is in their best interest to certainly pursue that, that type of activity. Uh, I'll just take you to one of the communications, Mr Elliot. Uh, it's HOS.0041-0001-0004. This is a letter to a member. Uh, it says, we are writing to advise that your account may soon be closed and your money transferred to the Australian Tax Office. <coughs> your account has been identified as at risk of becoming inactive. And under current legislation, we are required to transfer inactive accounts to the ATO. And it goes on to say, please note if your money is transferred to the <coughs> ATO, your super may not experience the same level of investment return as it would with Host Plus. And then it prompts that member to contact Host Plus. Yes. Uh, yes. Now, this, this letter, do you agree that it could be misunderstood by the reader as suggesting, particularly for readers who have low financial literacy, that they're going to lose their super, it's going to be taken by the ATO? I have to agree with you that um, uh, having, having looked at some of these particular statements, there is no doubt in my mind that um, we could be a lot better at articulating um, uh, in essence, the message that, that we're seeking to make. So in some instances, the, the, the member may be better off uh, staying uh, with the fund. And this is on the basis that they do respond to the letter. I mean, they're by virtue of the nature of the membership uh, or the member that's been targeted. Um, but I, I certainly, and I've already taken some learnings in relation to um, the messaging, but to the extent that the member then does respond and contacts the call centre, um, I know that there is a script that is specific to lost in, and inactive accounts, but there's a whole series of additional steps um, that the call centre uh, would seek to undertake in relation to trying to engage the member in the first instance, trying to uni uh, reunite the member through SuperCheck, uh, which is the ATO um, effectively matching, lost members matching uh, tool. Um, so there's a whole series of steps that um, would be undertaken as part of that health check. And the other element to it is um, the question of insurance and whether or not the member wishes to continue um, to avail themselves of the, um, of the insurance benefits that they may have, they may have uh, as part of their, their account. 
And there are, I, we do have a copy of the script, Mr Elia, but I can take you to it, um, one of the ones that HostPlus has produced. That's yes. HOS.0041.0001.0015. Thank you. Is this the sort of script that you were referring to earlier, when people ring up? Um, I have seen a much more detailed uh, script, but um, look to be uh, this is in relation to permanent exclusion. Permanent exclusion. Yes. And, and I'm happy to comment a little bit more about the trustee's definition of, of permanent exclusion, because it doesn't mean that they're permanently excluded, but I'm happy to come back and talk a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, I have seen a much broader script um, insofar as the call centre is concerned. This particular script uh, it has been produced, it has been used by Host Plus. Uh, yes, this is where, uh, my understanding is that this is where the member does move towards permanent exclusion uh, on the basis that they wish to retain their membership of Host Plus. There will always be a cohort of those members that have been contacted on the basis of being inactive who choose to roll their money out. So to the extent that a member chooses to, to be um, excluded, then that is the scripting that is that is provided, yes. Uh, I'll just take you to another document yes. that involves um, a communication about the ATO lost super, and that's HOS.0037.0001.16 Now, this, <coughs> this is a communication that ran as part of a campaign that Host Plus conducted called the Tick the Box, Hit the Box Office campaign. Do you, do you recall that, Mr Elliot? So I think that was a, uh, yes I do, that was a, that was a fund-wide campaign uh, that was undertaken by uh, the marketing team. Yes, I do recall that. So this uh, communication tells the member, it's a template, but yes. it, it did go out to members, <coughs> um, that's correct? This yes. went out. This went out to um, my understanding is the entire membership. There was a campaign um, that was that was driven by the marketing team that went out to the bulk of the membership. It wasn't just limited to a cohort of inactive members. But when you read this, Mr. Elliot, it's similar to the other one. But I'll read the first sentence. We are writing to advise that under government regulation, your Host Plus Super account will soon be closed yes. and the balance transferred to the ATO as inactive lost super. So it is directed to those accounts that are on the precipice of becoming closed, inactive. Yes, yes. So they were part of, part of, the, um, part of the broad, um, I suppose, category of members. But the campaign was actually, um, was actually targeted at, at the entire membership. And do you agree that this letter is also uh, could be understood by the average reader, particularly the young reader, as insinuating that they're going to lose their super to the ATO. Yeah, um, what I can tell you about the, the results of that campaign, if I may, uh, if it pleases the Commission, um, uh, there was about 18,500 members uh, that responded to this particular campaign, so 18,500 members. Um, uh, based on the information that I've been provided by, by my marketing team, uh, 2,000 of those members subsequently left the fund. As of today, as of today, there's 16,500 of those members, um, of which 14,500 have account balances of in excess of $6,000, and about 2,000 of those members, 2,000 of those members, their account balances are less than 2,000. I don't have a complete breakup of, of the, you know, what the account balances are. Um, but what I can tell you is about 180 of those members, about 180 of those members have had their account balances um, uh, go down to zero, 180 um, since, t since this campaign uh, was enacted. So that, that's, that's the broad breakup. So you're talking about the, well, your, what your analysis is of what might have happened to these members that got this communication, but you don't deny that this particular communication is potentially misleading and it doesn't tell the member um, the information they need to make a, an appropriate decision around them opting out, do you agree? No, I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's, it's misleading. I think it's sloppy um, to a large degree. Um, as I said, I mean, we, we, we should be getting much, much better at this and much more precise. I, I do, 
I mean, based on the on the results of the campaign that I've just outlined, um, of which this was part of that campaign, um, I think, you know, from my perspective and certainly the learnings from the team is that I think we need to be a lot more precise in relation to the way we articulate the messaging. What, one of the key features that the trustee genuinely believes in terms of the value add is the insurance that's actually provided to, to members overall. And if I may just give you some examples of, of that, um, I did ask the Host Plus team to go back and analyse all the claims uh, that were paid out, insurance claims, that were paid out over the course of the last 12 months. This is to 30 June um, 2018. There was 1,000, just over 1,400 insurance claims. 1,400 insurance claims were paid out. Of those, approximately 158, 158 of those insurance claims related to members with account balances of less than $1,000. Less than $1,000. And of those 158, 67 of those members that were paid out by the time the claim was paid out, had an account balance of zero. The total value, the total value of those claims was just under $15 million, $15 million that was paid out to um, either the individual member or their beneficiaries. So I just wish to highlight that because it is a, it is a balancing act for the trustee in order to balance out the overall benefits that a member continues to have by virtue of retaining their membership with Host Plus and at the same time protecting the member's account balances uh, by virtue of erosion of fees and, and taxes. And, and the other point, if I may uh, just make, 20% uh, of, the, of the members of Host Plus that are 20 years or under have elected to opt out of any insurance coverage. So it's about 20% is the figure that uh, my team have provided me with. Can uh, I <clears throat> ask you more generally, uh, if we look at inactives, we look at small accounts, we look at multiple super accounts, that is accounts with Host Plus and with others. Yes. Are you able to describe what you see as being the trustee's uh, role, if you like, the trustee's duty uh, in respect of uh, any or all of those groups, inactives, smalls, multiples? Yeah, I mean, the trustee commissioner has a, has a duty to act in the best interest of, of, of all the members of, of the fund. Uh, we're a fund of 1.1 million members, so the, the challenge in the Balancing Act is to try and strike the right balance between looking at an individual's personal circumstances and then setting up the structure of the fund, both in terms of its fees um, and charges, insofar as it relates to insurance, to strike that, that right balance. And I think that's the tension at the moment between the trustee's obligation and the legislation as it relates to um, lost and, and inactive accounts. Um, I must confess, having you know, read the, the criteria by which lost and inactive members are to be transferred to the ATO, my initial um, conclusion was that the ATO doesn't want these members. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, very high bar. Uh, the fund up until the introduction of my super um, where member protection rules applied, account balances of less than $1,000 were protected. And Host Plus, um, uh, the trustee carried that cost. And from 2005, six through to 30 June, 2013, the cost um, over that period of time was in excess of $100 million in member protection costs. So from my perspective, and, and I know that uh, the minister has moved towards uh, introducing fee caps with respect to small account balances, I think that's absolutely appropriate. But we, we must remember someone has to pay. And, and ultimately, you have this notion of cross subsidisation that will occur from, from bigger account balance holders or higher account balance holders. So I don't have a, a, the right answer for you, but these are some of the tensions that not only Host Plus, 
but certainly other industry players continually grapple with in terms of the design of the fund. So one of the things that we've sought to do, uh, Commissioner, is one, keep our fee at $78 uh, per year, which is $1.50 per member per week. We do not have a percentage-based administration fee, uh, and that's a very, very important feature of the trustee's desire to keep um, fees uh, incredibly low. And obviously, um, the other key component is around the insurance design uh, of the fund, and that's something that the, that the trustee continually reviews on a regular basis. And I think we've provided some material that highlights that the premiums that are now being charged to the young membership have declined over a uh, long period of time, and the trustee is in the process of taking some additional steps, but is waiting until the outcome of, um, of the minister's proposed legislation uh, relating to um, insurance opt-out and opt-in. Mr Elliot, you mentioned before that uh, some research was done about the claims made and you've been stressing the importance of the insurance, but you mentioned that approximately 158 claims related to the members with account balances of less than $1,000. Uh, yeah, this is at 30 June 2018, so I was, I was provided with that data by, by my team. Uh, now, I won't take you back to it, but your witness statement has a figure of the, figure, the member accounts that have less than 1,000. It's over 55,000. So you're saying that it's in the interest of the best interest of these members that all these members have their balances eroded by insurance premiums so that the odd 100 or so can claim. No, no I'm, not, I'm not saying that, that at all. Um, can I just see the, the figure that, that um, the table that you are? referring your to, if table, I may. Uh, yes. In your statement, it's on page seven, Mr Elia. Uh, on my, okay, beg your pardon. Uh, paragraph 24, yes, that's right. Uh, page seven. Um, yes, so, so I'm just using that to illust illustrate the, the point. Um, the, the premium is, is age-based, so the premium that's actually charged to members' accounts is age-based. Uh, for example, um, if a member is 16 years or under, uh, they, they're only provided with a death-only cover. That's 24, I think it's about 26 cents per, per week, which works out to about $12 per year for that death cover. Uh, members, I think, under the age of from 17 to 16, sorry, from 19 to 16, I think from memory it's about a dollar uh, per week of unit cover, uh, which provides them with death and, and TPD. So it works out to about $52 per year. So the, the trustee has worked incredibly hard to get that balance absolutely right between the provision of default cover for young members, um, understanding the impact, the potential impact of erosion of account balances, um, but at the same time, uh, putting in place features that allow the members, allow the member to easily opt out, easily opt out to the extent um, that they wish out of insurance. And the trustee this year, this is at 30, uh, this is at March this year, had also taken the additional step of um, looking to make insurance an opt-in feature for members under the age of, of 19. So. Under it's the age of? 19, yeah. under the age of 19. So it's, it's not a perfect science, but the trustee hasn't sat, sat back and not looked at this particular issue on an ongoing basis. And I think what you'll find is that over the course of the last six to seven years, the, the premiums that are charged to members have declined, have declined uh, across the broader membership. We did have one particular spike um, in, in one year, but over time, the funds, certainly since 2015, uh, significantly altered its uh, insurance uh, structure, benefit structure, benefit design structure, specifically to cater for young memberships. And the other point, if I may make, is this. Premiums is, is only one factor that is a feature of any insurance that's provided to, to members. I often say that the devil is in the detail. At Host Plus, for example, um, and it's not something I, I generally publicly talk about, but Host Plus does not have a suicide exclusion. 
in its policy. And given the nature of the young demographic of Host Plus, um, increases in youth suicide, uh, mental health, that, that's something that, that the trustee does think about and it is reflective of the underlying premium um, that is charged to, to members. Um, we will pay out multiple uh, insurance claims. If a member has claimed against another insurance policy, we will pay out the insured amount. Uh, we don't reduce the insured amount. Um, so I, I appreciate the focus on, on cost, um, but I think it's also incredibly important to think through the specific insurance and design features um, underlying that, that actual premium. But, um, Ms Diaz, I, I absolutely understand where you're coming from in relation to you know, striking that right balance between not eroding members' account balances but doing everything we possibly can to engage the members to, to the best of our abilities to let them know that, one, they do have some element of insurance coverage, but I do want to stress the point that you know, members have been able to benefit, albeit as a small cohort. Uh, uh, insurance is a risk-related issue. You never know how many members are likely to um, make a claim, but I, I just want to make the point that members have certainly benefited um, as a consequence of having in insurance coverage. Uh, Commissioner, I might tender a few documents at that juncture, if that's a suitable moment. Uh, the template letter, uh, HOS.0041.0001.0004. That's letter to lost members at February 15, Exhibit 5.173. And the script, HOS.0041.0001.0015. Script for lost members, Exhibit 5.174. And the hit the box office campaign letter. Inactive template letter cycle 1, 2016, Exhibit 5.175. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, um, Ms. Dares, may I make one final point, uh, if I may? Uh, just, just in relation to round off this particular issue. Um, yes, I just want to talk about permanent, the notion of permanent exclusion. Um, so th from the trustee's perspective, permanent exclusion does not mean that the trustee will not, does not have an obligation to go back and review any of the permanent exclusions that a, an individual member has actually made. In fact, the trustee has a program of works um, uh, that it tends to undertake with respect to looking at every single member, every single member that has put a permanent exclusion on their flag, a permanent exclusion flag on their account to ensure that it is in their best interest. And that's something that the Host Plus Board uh, will be um, appraised of and updated of. Thank you. When was that decision made? No, that's as a consequence, um, Commissioner, of our learnings as part of this process and the best, uh, I think the, the best practice guide uh, the ATO's best practice guide does talk about um, the trustee. Oh, well, that's telling me when. When was the decision made? Um, this was made as a consequence of, of what we've learned as part of the um, part of tendering the documents. Uh. So, in the last week, Mr. Elliot? No, it's basically in the last month or so. Last month or so. It's something that the executive team is, is certainly the operations team um, have raised with me. I see. Uh, now, before you were talking about insurance and erosion um, of member balances, the, the premium, just to cut to the chase, the premium is a very important source of revenue for the fund. That's correct? Uh, for the fund? Yes, in that the fund can claim deductions and use the surplus deductions, the surplus tax, sorry. Um, and that is an important source of revenue for the fund. I might take you to a document, but do you agree with that, firstly? Um, so the fund, uh, so the, the tax deductibility of premiums, uh, and this is something I think that's been in existence since the fund was actually set up, is at a fund level, as distinct to an individual level, um, if, I believe if that's, that's what you're alluding to. That's, that's been a feature of the fund, I think, since it was set up. And the fundamental reason as to why that is the case is that because it is a group life policy and the benefits of any, any premiums or benefits that arise by virtue of the risk profiling of the fund in terms of its negotiations with the insurers, the deductibility is actually 
um, made at a fund at a fund level. Yes. Uh, I'll just take you to a document, the first page, the first doc ID of which is HOS.0005.0003.7082. This is this is a board pack or sorry, a strategic plan from 2018. It's very recent. The second page will show that, I think. Uh, if we can go to dot seven three seven four. Page, oh, sorry, seven three seven four. Commissioner. So that's HOS dot triple zero five dot triple zero three dot seven three zero seven four. Sorry, it's a very big extract. Mr Elliot, I'm not sure if you have a copy there, but in short, it basically says that there'll be an impact to the administration reserve if um, the code is... Well, I think we'd better see the document. Yes. Yeah, when I... I might take you to your CEO report from as recent as July, Mr Elliot, maybe we'll do that. That's HOS.0037.0001.02.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0
Uh, we might stand down for one minute or two minutes, with Commissioner, to see if the uh, soft can be brought out. Day, but let's sort this out. Yes, we will. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. We, we hope, we think we have the document now. <coughs> so it's uh, the CEO board report. Mr. Ellie, you can see that's an extract from that report that you delivered to the board in July. And there's a heading there, Measure 3, Insurance for Superannuation measure, Members. Uh, <coughs> can you just explain to the Commissioner what you're referring to here by Measure 3? Yeah, so it, maybe if we just go back uh, to the first, <coughs> to the previous page, and if I could just provide and maybe the, we, we the might have to put some them side by side. Yeah. Still, yep. zero seven. Yes. So, so um, this was in response, as as I um, outline here. In fact, there's there's probably a there's a, another comment that specifically references an APRA inquiry that was made on the back of an article uh, that was published by Aaron Patrick in the Australian Financial Review. Um, talk to this notion of ghost accounts um, and host plus certain numbers were uh, quoted uh, in the article uh, that were actually not correct. Um, so I was approached by APRA who I think from memory were appearing before a Senate select inquiry I think the following day or the day before and they thought that this issue might actually come up. And I was asked to just provide them with um, just an overview, brief overview of um, what the impact of the, uh, the government's proposed changes uh, that um, relate to fee caps, um, uh, insurance uh, to be on an opt-in basis for members under the age of 25 or 25 and under. Uh, so what I sought to do there, uh, information that's been supplied by my finance team, uh, we sought to try and provide a quick snapshot of what the impact would be on the fund if the totality of those measures uh, were in fact legislated. Um, that, was, that was the essence of it. Um, so uh, yeah, very high level overview in that regard. Thank you. So we see there that you ha you've said you've written in this report Approximately 670,739 <coughs> Host Plus members will potentially have their insurance cover cancelled yes. as a result of falling into at least one of the following categories. Members with low balances less than 6,000, members under the age of 25 years or members whose accounts have not received a contribution in 13 months. You go on to say, together it is estimated that this membership cohort pays default insurance premiums of 96.8 million per annum. This represents 43% of the total insurance premiums paid to MetLife of 225 million. Uh, just pausing there, MetLife is the group insurer. Uh, yes, that is, that is correct. That's They're correct. our group life insurer, yes. Uh, and then you go on to say the host plus administration reserve accrues a tax benefit on insurance premiums paid. The tax benefit received by the fund is equal to 15% of the insurance premium paid. Yes. If the proposed policy has the effect of reducing total premiums paid by 96.8 million per annum, then the host plus benefit will be reduced by 14.5 million per annum. And then you go on to discuss the uh, host plus administration reserve has a forecast to hold a healthy balance of approximately 172 million. The total impact on the funds Administration reserve position on a do nothing scenario would see this reserve reduce to approximately 45 million. Um, what do you mean by a do nothing scenario there, Mr. Mr. Elliot? So, so do, do nothing simply implied. Um, there's been a lot of articles written, and I think a fair amount of research being done on the impact of any premium um, rises that may occur as a consequence of a diminishing pool. So um, do nothing in essence means you know lack of you know no re-engagement activation. Uh, members choose not to opt in. Um, it's not entirely clear how the proposed legislation would uh, would come into effect. Uh, one of the things that I think I've since learnt is that I think the government's proposals, as I understand them, would only apply to new members as distinct to existing members. Now, I, I might be wrong, but I, I believe that that's where um, the, the proposed legislation is heading. 
in which case the impact of the uh, the impact on the reserve as outlined there would actually not not occur um, so there's a whole series of things um, inputs um, that we're not entirely clear, clear about um, that would have some type of impact on on the reserve including any potential increases in insurance premiums uh, that may occur and some of the some of the research that I've seen suggests that insurance premiums could rise by about 30 per cent um, for the existing insured members. But what you've set out here shows that Host Plus is reliant on these cohorts uh, with the low balances who are young and are not likely to need the cover. They are essentially propping up the fund with their insurance premiums, is that correct? No, I'd no, no, I certainly wouldn't put it that way. Um, uh, this is a much broader cohort, so you do have members, and we don't philosophically agree, by the way, that members should be excluded. Uh, certainly members um, between the age of 25 and maybe up to age 20. I mean, it's generally where people are actually you know, moving into the workforce and actually do need insurance. So th th this is not a position that Host Plus, as the trustee, would certainly agree with. And I know quite a number of my industry counterparts would have a very, very similar view. Um, there probably needs to be an age cut off, and we think 19 is probably about about right. But the fund certainly does derive a tax benefit, uh, as is outlined here. You say moving into the uh, workforce need insurance. Insurance of what kind? Uh, it's death and TPD. The fund does not offer income protection uh, on an op uh, on a um, default basis, it is on an opt-in basis. You say that those moving into the workforce require both kinds of insurance. Uh, the way that the fund is currently, the answer is no. Uh, we do have, as I said earlier on, for um, some parts of the younger membership, death only cover, uh, and then as they get older, um, I think from age 17 onwards, it's death and TPD. Uh, it's still one unit of, of death, which is approximately $26,000, and two units of TPD, which is about just over $50,000. What's the purpose of the Host Plus Admin Reserve? Uh, the Admin Reserve um, Commissioner is, is the reserve that uh, largely collects the $1.50 per member per week charge, $78 per week charge, and from which the operating costs of Host Plus are funded from. From the reserve. From the from the reserve. Yes. Yep. Now earlier in the year, Mr. Elliot, Host Plus. Oh, I should tender that document, Commissioner, the board extract. <coughs> extract from CEO report to board meeting of 27 July 18. Uh, HOS 0037 0001 and 10. Exhibit 5.176. Uh, Host Plus had its insurance arrangements reviewed by Rice Warner. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we had uh, we had a review done uh, the prior year in, in 2017. And Rice Warner found that there was an issue with the premiums being less affordable for members on lower salaries. That's correct? Uh, yes, uh, I think from memory. I, if I can... I haven't read the report in its entirety, but... Uh, um, I, I, I do believe that that was one of the things that they did pick up. Um, the part, part of the review was to also um, move the fund towards uh, its adherence to the insurance uh, industry code, which was a voluntary code that um, uh, superannuation funds like Host Plus um, signed up for. Um, one of the key aspects of the insurance code was to limit uh, premiums to under 1%, under 1% uh, of an individual's salary. And, uh, and the review, to some degree, sought to factor that, that in as well. And the code also has a provision about automatic insurance ceasing after 13 months, or 13 months after contributions cease, where the balance is less than 6,000. Yeah, yeah, the code, the code um, uh, suggested 13. Uh, I think Host Plus took the view that I uh, can't recall if it was 16 or, or 18 months, would be more reflective of the nature of, um, I suppose, the work patterns of, of our young members. Um, if I was to cut the uh, inactive account balances on the basis of an 18-month contribution, 
uh, that 160,000 in membership would reduce by about 35 to 40,000 members, uh, just by virtue of shifting the contribution, um, inactive contribution definition from 12 months to 18 months. And again, it just highlights, I suppose, the, the breaks in work patterns, um, uh, the temporary nature of, of some of the work, the seasonal nature of some of our employees. So it's about 30, 35, 40 odd thousand dollars. There are 30, 35 to 40 odd thousand members. But Bryce Warner found that the number of claims for members under 25 is, is very low, they're, and they're actually overinsured. <coughs> uh, yeah, I can't recall if that was the, the conclusion that, that was reached. Um, I would certainly need to, to have a look at the, the report. But, but either way, the, the decision that the board certainly took was to accept Rice Warner's recommendation insofar as um, uh, making insurance for people from uh, 19 and under um, on an opt-in basis. I'll just take you to a member statement, Mr Elliot. That's uh, hos.0044.0001.0013. So this member seems to have an inactive account, at least you can see there that for that half year they haven't had any contributions paid in. Is that correct? Well, this it's very, very difficult um, to, to make any assumptions about the nature of the member's desire to take advantage of insurance arrangements but have their superannuation may be held in a self-managed super fund or elsewhere. Well, uh, that wasn't my question, Mr Elliot. I just simply, reading the statement, there's no cash flows going in. Do that, you agree with that? Uh, yes, I can see that. That's, that's yes. correct. Uh, and the investment return is $83. Yes. And the administration fees coming out are 39 Yes. And the insurance premiums coming out are $565.59. That's correct. Yes. Now, they have a closing balance of 1216 and assuming that the following year the same insurance premium is taken out, within a couple of years they'll, well, every six months actually, that's, that's correct. That's correct. It'll, they'll be ending up with a zero balance. Can Do you I, agree? Can I see the actual insurance cover that this person actually has, please? Well, I don't, I don't have the insurance cover. I think it's very, Mr. very important. It may, be in the, it may be in the remainder of the statement. That can be handed to you if you want to um, peruse that. Commissioner, if I may provide some context. This member is actually age 33. It does appear to me that this member has actively sought to increase their insurance arrangements above the default, which is why uh, I think if we turn to the actual insured amount, that may actually give us some, some more information. Well, it's just an example, Mr Elliot, of how the insurance premiums can erode balances is what is the point that I'm seeking to make. So, again, if, if I look at the members' insured amount, it's, it's eight units of cover, which seems to be above, above the default amount at that particular age demographic. Um, it's, it's not uncommon for, and we do see this, and this is symptomatic, I think, of a, a broader industry issue where certain members will specifically make a decision to take advantage of an industry fund's low-cost insurance offering, and, and Host Plus is, is one of those, um, by deliberately parking a sufficient amount of money um, that would allow for the deductibility of the premiums. Now, um, what would be worthwhile uh, is to see what subsequently happened to this member during the course of 2018, whether or not this particular member may have um, contributed uh, more money. But I do accept uh, Ms Diaz, your, your point that if this member does nothing, does nothing, then clearly over time um, their contribution or their account balance will reduce. That's absolutely correct. Uh, yes. Now, just to finish up this in, these insurance issues, why does Host Plus keep the tax benefit on the insurance premiums paid? You mentioned that that's something that some industry uh, 
yeah. participants do, but others do not. Why does Host yeah. Plus do that and not return the, the, the benefit of that to members? Yeah, again, I mean, the, the fund was, was set up 30 years ago, so it was certainly before, before my time. Um, that's been the, the underlying business rules of the fund. And my understanding is that it, it has a, a lot to do with the fact that the that the overall it is a group life policy. So it's not an individual policy, insurance policy. It is a group life policy, which is a function of the demographics of the entirety of the fund and the risk risk profiling of the fund. And therefore, it's the entire membership to some degree that um, contributes to the overall premium. Um, uh, structure of, of the fund or premium design of the fund and therefore the benefits uh, of the premiums deductibility should be enjoyed by the entirety of, of the membership. Um, and Host Plus is not uncommon, uncommon in terms of having that deductibility at a fund level. Uh, and also I just wanted to see if you're aware of the consideration that the board's given to the requirements in the Act in the CIS Act, the Superannuation Supervision, uh, Industry Supervision Act, to only offer insurance a particular kind where it won't inappropriately erode members' balances. Have you considered that yourself? Do you know if the board has considered that? Oh, I mean, uh, the answer to that is yes, and the Rice uh, Warner report, and R Rice Warner have been engaged by Host Plus on, to conduct numerous reviews. Uh, that that review su supports that, that particular obligation. So th the board does, <laughs> give genuine regard to you know, this notion of balancing out what is an appropriate level of cover uh, for its, its members, um, understanding also the design features of, of the fund uh, as it relates to the underlying detail of the insurance policy, um, such as no suicide exclusions or no exclusions in relation to multiple payments of benefits. Okay. Now, you describe the insurance as a low cost uh, offering. Uh, can you quantify that or give some numerical description of it? Um, I, I don't. The answer to that is is yes, it is low cost relative to um, some of um, other super funds, uh, including other industry funds. Uh, I don't have that specific information at hand, but I would be very, very happy to supply that. And that's, I think, it's contained within the Rice Warner report that does if benchmark. Host Plus's insurance premiums at particular age demographics. Uh, if it assists Mr Elliot, Mr Elmsley has sworn a statement that will be tendered in due course, but that has the average premium of being around $200 per member per annum. So that's the, but that's on average across that, that the is, membership. Yeah, yeah so. that's on average. And that would um, presumably also include any members who've taken out additional insurance above and beyond the default. Uh, but Commissioner, it's, it is a very, very competitive, in fact, it's probably one of the lowest cost insurance offerings, certainly for the younger demographics of the, of the fund. Okay. Uh, uh, was there anything further on, on that, Commissioner? No. Uh, it's part of the Commissioner's terms of reference, Mr Elliott, to consider whether the use of members' superannuation retirement savings is in the best interests of members. I, I wanted to ask you some questions about how the trustee uses members' money. And I'll just recap on something you said before to confirm how the trustee meets the costs of administering the fund. Yes. Um, there's a large administration reserve, is that correct? So the administration reserve, I think it's approximately $170 million, that's correct. Yes. And that's funded by the administrative fees that are debited from the members' accounts? Yes, yeah, so, so Host Plus charges its members $78 uh, per year or $1.50 per member per week. Uh, and that fee uh, is then allocated to the admin reserve, and the admin reserve um, is then utilised to pay the, the administration operating costs uh, of the fund. It include marketing, uh, would include administration, uh, salaries, um, office overheads, um, other operating expenses. And the trustee governs how the trustee can charge uh, for its fees and cover costs and disbursements, is that correct? Uh, yes. yes. And the trustee provides that the trustee may engage in any marketing or promotional activity which it determines will promote the concept of superannuation and industry um, superannuation funds generally. Yeah, I think the trustee talks about um, uh, growth, um, growing the membership, and also talks about defending the contribution base. That's correct. But that power will be subject to the sole purpose test in the 
CIS Act, you, you're aware of that, and the obligation to act in the member's best interests. Yes, that's correct. Uh, now, the budget for marketing, if we could just have a quick look at that, that's HOS.0014001. Uh, uh, and Commissioner, I will turn to that member statement that we looked at a little earlier. Opportune time. What was the date of the member the statement? statement? 2015. Uh, HOS.004. Oh, no, the date oh, sorry. of the member statement. Oh, that I thought relatively current. Yes. 30 June 2017, 2015. Member statement 30 June 17, HOS 0011 0001 0019, Exhibit 5.177. Thank you. So just looking at that table, uh, Mr Elia, we see that the marketing budget for the 2017-2018, that, that period there, um, or marketing expense. Is the years Sorry? ended 17? The years ended 20, 2017, that's right. 21.44. Yes. Is that correct? And what, does, what expenses are included in that? Uh, so, uh, there are, I think, two components in relation, uh, sorry, three components in relation to that. Uh, the first component relates to uh, the fund's uh, uh, branding, brand marketing uh, strategy. Um, the second component of that, that includes both um, sponsorship arrangements um, uh, and above the line traditional forms of media, TV, um, uh, print, uh, radio. Uh, second category would relate to what we call alliance industry partnerships, uh, which would include um, uh, partnership agreements, sponsorship agreements with uh, various associations, including in our case the um, Australian Hotels Association and United Voice, two of our sponsoring organisations. Mm -hmm. And the third component of that, again from memory, would relate to the ISA. Um, uh, contribution uh, that Host Plus um, makes with regard to the various campaigns that ISA runs. I think, I think I think that's I think that's right off the top of my head. Okay, and that that's gone up um, <coughs> quite significantly since 2013. Yeah. So when Choice of Fund was introduced in 2013, um, and my super was was introduced. Um, uh, the trustee at, at that time, uh, the strategy was to uh, certainly ensure that we did everything we possibly can through our branding efforts to retain and uh, grow the membership of the fund, uh, and in so doing, you know, deliver the scale benefits that, that ultimately reflected through um, low administration fees and improved investment performance, uh, and as well enhancements in terms of the service and product offering that we offer our members. And where uh, in this document, or at least maybe in that first page, we can probably put the next page up as well, that's 0258, uh, where is uh, the accountability for the corporate hospitality expenses or the entertainment expenses? Uh, where yes. is that found? So, so there is a separate line item on page one in relation to entertainment expenses. Mm -hmm. I think you can see that at $266,000. And um, within within the marketing, within the um, the sponsorship category, there there would also be some corporate hospitality built into that as well. Uh, in your statement, you say that Host Plus senior executives informally entertain current and prospective employers to grow and retain funds yes. to the advantage of scale. You say that that, that? that is correct. I mean, the, the the real I mean, relationships are incredibly important. Um, certainly in our industry. And uh, the battle, if I can use that term, is all about retention of the default fund status. And uh, retaining um, employers 
um, through relationship-driven um, activities, of which entertainment uh, is a subset of, of what we do, is certainly absolutely important uh, in terms of retaining the membership and also in doing so, again, uh, retaining those scale benefits that, that flow through to our members. And the executives of Host Plus, including yourself, they have uh, Amex cards that are authorised, or they had Amex cards that are authorised under the internal control environmental policy, is that correct? So myself uh, and the executive team, uh, we've all, we, we have corporate cards, uh, was Amex. Uh, we've now moved to um, ME Bank Diners uh, cards. I think it's the Citibank platform. And um, yes, we do have, we do, and the chairman of Host Plus also has a credit card, uh, a corporate card. Thank you. And that policy, uh, which you do exhibit that to your statement, that provides for a monthly requisition which has to be completed by the accounts payable officer and then approved by the cardholder and, and yourself? Uh, so in relation to all the other executives, uh, that's correct. Uh, in my case, the chairman of Host Plus signs off on my corporate, uh, corporate credit card. Uh, now, Host Plus was the subject of a notice like others, uh, requiring production of certain s credit card statements. I just want to ask you about some major transactions that I won't bring up Please. the statements, Mr Elliott, but you'll, you'll recall these transactions. Um, in respect of the Australian Open, uh, so Plus doesn't sponsor the Australian Open. We are not a sponsor of the Australian Open, no. no. Uh, I think, from memory, MLC used to be a sponsor. I'm not certain if they're still a sponsor, an ANZ or a sponsor. But Host Plus staff host employers and other stakeholders each year by taking them to the open? That is, that is correct. It's, um, it's probably our flagship um, corporate entertainment uh, event that we do. Um, this year uh, alone, we invited approximately 120 employers, uh, which accounted for about $4 billion in, in funds under management and about 160,000 uh, members. So it is, it's, a, it's a great time of the year for us to do that. Um, uh, it's, it's a national event driven by the marketing um, and state, uh, state offices. Uh, we have uh, key employers, um, key stakeholders, alliance partners flying in from, from all over Australia to participate in that. And how much was spent on those packages, Mr Elliot? I think, I think from memory, the total cost is about 260,000, um, which, yeah, about 260,000, I think, from, from memory. And you attended this year? I, I, yes, I, I did. I attended, uh, I didn't attend as many <coughs> sessions as, uh, as I have in the past, but yes, I, I do. It's, it's a very, very important part, certainly from my perspective um, and the senior executive team. Uh, we have uh, senior leaders in, in the industry. Um, it's a great time for us all to meet before the busy season all starts. Uh, it's a great way, certainly from, from my perspective and the executive team's perspective, to um, um, establish very, very early on um, and retain the relationships that are absolutely critical in terms of um, retaining the default fund status of, of our members and therefore retaining the members. The fund, you acknowledged at the start of your testimony, does very well in terms of its returns. Why do you think employee, employers need to be entertained in this way yeah. to choose or to retain their choice yeah. of Host Plus as the default status yeah. fund? Um, it is a competitive market um, out there. Um, our, our competitors are, are doing exactly the same thing. In fact, um, th they are there. Um, whether it's the retail funds, whether it's you know a, a number of other industry funds, um, different organisations will do different things uh, in order to um, hold on to those relationships. Relationships are really, really important um, uh, in our sector. Uh, we have lost business. Uh, I'm happy to give you an example. You know, of, of a leading hotel chain, one of the largest in the world, by virtue of the fact that the CEO did not have a, a relationship you know, with the key stakeholders there. So, you know, um, it's a competitive market out there. Relationships are important. Uh, we know our retail fund competitors uh, leverage relationships, whether it's banking relationships. Uh, they will use corporate hospitality. Um, other industry fund competitors will, will do the like. We're not the only organisation that um, embarks on corporate hospitality. Um, but it's a very, very important part of our retention program and we do it for the sole purpose of retaining the membership of Host Plus. 
and we have been very, very successful in retaining those, those relationships by and large, and we see that through the growth of the fund. Um, I think the only time I'll ever know if, if it works or it doesn't, if, if you stop, if you stop marketing, uh, you, you stop these types of corporate, corporate entertainment, um, but it is a, and every dollar counts, can I just make the point, every dollar count, um, $250,000 um, in relation to um, the tennis, um, uh, you know, that you know, we're running a $100 million budget, um, so that represents about 25 basis points um, of the total expenses. And I think if you were to do um, the sums, it, it would work out to less than one cent a, a week in terms of the admin admin fee. So it's a very, very important integral part of our retention strategy. Mr Elliot, does it concern you that you, CEO of Host Plus, a very successful fund, has to do this to retain members? It does. And I wish I didn't have to do it. But the reality is, is that it is a competitive landscape that we're dealing with. I would love nothing more than to have certainty about our, our member demographic and about employers staying with Host Plus. But I can give you plenty of examples where Host Plus, despite the fact that Host Plus is the best performing fund in Australia, despite the fact that Host Plus has the lowest fees, we have lost We've lost employees, we've lost default fund status to other organisations by virtue of the relationships, the relationships. Relationships are absolutely important in business. In my world, I see it all the time. Relationships are absolutely critical. And where you have, you may have one or two individuals ostensibly making default fund decisions on behalf of, of their entire workforce. Let me tell you, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that we lose um, default fund status or we lose employers to other competitors, to poorer performing funds, high fee paying funds. It does not make any sense to me. So retention of defaults is absolutely critical um, and unashamedly, unashamedly, we utilise you know, entertainment, corporate hospitality in order to strengthen the relationships that we have with our employers, you need to do that. Remember, they've they've all got banking relationships as well. You know, they're being pressured. So, in other words, everyone is doing it. So you have to do it too. Is that what you're no, saying? I'm, look, I'd, as I said, I'd prefer not not to do it. But the reality is, in in my world, in the competitive world that that we're actually operating in, it it happens, and we're not the only organisation um, that that does it. But every, everyone understands the importance of relationship, but um, Ms Diaz, I want to make the point, I wish I could cut, and in fact, we, we, we're always looking at ways to try and reduce and cut our marketing costs, but under the threat of opening up of the default system, and you know, you've heard, you've heard some commentary made about that in terms of um, some of the proposals that have been um, bandied around. Um, relationships are going to become incredibly important in terms of the retaining the default fund status um, of our members. And ultimately the relationships, and this is the business to business relationships, having strong relationships with the employers does give us access. And Host Plus largely operates a, a, a what I would call a wholesale distribution model. So we don't have a retail based model in terms like our retail fund competitors. We don't have an army of, of you know, sales force. We don't have financial planners that, that we largely rely on in order to bring in business. We don't have big branches that we can leverage off. So relationships are absolutely important. Wholesale distribution is a hallmark of the industry fund system. And I know Host Plus is a bit of an outlier when it comes to some of our you know, sister funds, some of the other industry funds, and, and maybe we are a reflection of, of the hospitality and tourism sector of which we, we are part of. Um, but that is the core purpose and the sole purpose, and it's all driven by retention and delivering and continuing to deliver great outcomes for our members by virtue of the scale benefits that, that ultimately are delivered. And it works. By and large, it, it works. We have been able to retain a significant cohort of, of our membership, um, but at the same time, we've lost, we've lost employers as well. 
I'll just go through a number of other transactions, yes. Mr Elliott. Let's see if these ring a bell. So $40,000 spent in respect of Etihad Stadium last year in April. What was yes. that in respect of? So uh, again, so, so the that um, their tickets, their medallion club tickets, um, that again forms part of the entertainment expenses. There are two components to that. Um, again, one is client entertainment, so along the lines that I've just alluded to in terms of retention, um, retaining the employers, and the other one, uh, the other component is that the tickets are used uh, for reward and recognition uh, within within the host plus um, trustee office. It largely, and I will say largely, about 90%, 98% are directed towards our service centre. So Host Plus is a little bit unique in that we operate a call centre at Host Plus and we run quite a number of reward and, and recognition programs. Um, call centres are notorious for high levels of, of turnover and I'm certainly happy to, to give you some more insights in terms of some of the great work that we've been doing around that. So, Mr Elliott, we saw at the start of your evidence that 161,000 accounts have less than $6,000 in them. Yeah. Many of them are being eroded by premiums and fees down to zero. Do you consider it's the best use of the trust money to, to purchase these sorts of corporate packages? Yes, yeah, so... Yes, yep, yes, sorry, answer, sorry, yes. Beg your pardon, sorry. Um, so, can I just m make the point again? Um, the, the the cost the cost of of funding um, the entertainment expenditure comes out of the one dollar fifty per member per week charge the seventy eight dollars so we're not dipping into investment reserves in in order to to fund um, the, the entertainment expenditure or or the marketing expenditure so I, I just want to make make that one point it's coming out of the trust money it, it is of course, all all the reserves are all the reserves belong to the members. So, so I just want to make that absolutely clear. Okay. It's, it's, it's not an insignificant sum of money. You're 100% right. Um, it's, it is a lot of money, but it's done for the right purposes. It's done for the purposes of, first and foremost, retaining the default, the default within the employers that we, we obviously target. It's absolutely critical for us to do that in order to retain the membership and continue to deliver the scale benefits that we have been able to deliver to our members. Um, if everyone stops, Ms Diaz, I'm, I'm very, if, if we, we ban marketing, if, if people wish to do that, that's perfectly fine by me. Um, but the reality is in, in my world, my competitors are, are doing just that. I'm not suggesting it makes it right, but, but that's in essence the nature of competition in the marketplace. Um, and I have said it on, on a couple of occasions that um, we would love nothing more than to get some certainty. Um, the importance of retaining these relationships with key employers, which goes to the heart of retaining their default fund um, arrangements, are absolutely in the best interest of our members by virtue of the fact that we are delivering great returns, great returns for our members. And as I alluded to earlier on, we have a history of delivering outstanding investment returns, and that is in the members' best interest, and at the same time, doing everything we possibly can to keep our administration fee at $1.50. And as I alluded to earlier on, that has not changed since 2004, including during a period where the fund was wearing the cost of member protection. So, so even under that particular period, the fund was quite resilient. Well, I think I, under so. I understand the points you're making, but uh, <clears throat> the premise for them is that uh, performance is not enough as a, to sell. C Commissioner, is that right? Commissioner, performance is not enough. There are so many irrational decisions that have been made. Host Plus loses approximately $500 million a year in rollovers out to underperforming funds, high cost funds. I sit there every day and just think, why does this happen? Host Plus loses default fund status, loses, and I'm sure we've provided, and you've probably seen some of the reports. In fact, the July board meeting had a, quite an extensive report about the losses that the fund has incurred um, over the course of the last 12 months. We regularly report this. If it was a rational market, um, I think Host Plus would be, should be 10 times the size of AMP should be 10 times the size 
of any of our competitor funds. It, it's just illogical to think how underperforming funds, high cost funds, continue to grow at the expense of high performing funds. So there are other factors at play. Vice, I, I think yeah. you have made yeah. that point yeah. more than once. Uh, the purpose of marketing, you say, is to retain default status, is that right? That is one component of it, yes. The, the, the other component is in relation to building our brand awareness. Um, we're, we're seeing a significant move towards individual choice of funds where brand recognition is also an incredibly important part of retaining our membership. Our public offer division has continued to grow and, and by that I mean uh, this is, these are individuals that seek to join Host Plus, in, presumably independent of you know, any enterprise agreement or default fund status. And we're seeing, we're seeing as account balances continue to grow, as members start becoming much more engaged, and we're seeing that, we're seeing that, um, individuals are certainly making choices. And the fact of the matter is brands are incredibly important. Our young membership is attracted to brands. My kids are attracted to brands. Brands play such an integral part in the decision-making processes. Forget underperformance at times. It, it probably explains why the retail funds and the AMPs of this world, they've had a 200-year head start to build their brands and build trust. That's what they've done. Host Plus has largely been embarking on a brand-building campaign since 2006 when and then Howard and Costello governments deregulated the superannuation industry. They opened up, they removed default funds as an allowable matter and it opened up the marketplace for full-blown competition. Host Plus responded by starting to build its brands and what happened during that particular period was that actually industry funds grew. Uh, Mr Elia, uh you're aware that Section 68A of the SIS Act prohibits a trustee of a superannuation fund or any of its associates offering goods or services to a person on the condition that the person's employees will become a member of the trustee's superannuation fund. Yes. Now, I'm not asking you to disclose any privileged communications or legal yes. advice. Have you, have you or the board considered that section in the context of these sorts of activities? Well, we have, and it's, it's not done on a condition conditionality basis. So. Um, it's an inducement, but there's no condition. Is that what you're saying? Look, I, I'm, I'm not a legal person. Um, I'm not certain that's the word. That's, th that's not the word. It is, it is one of numerous things that we do, numerous things that we do, information sessions, uh, employer information ses sessions. Uh, we run a whole series of investment forums. It's about education. It is about engagement. Um, it is not an inducement. Um, uh, in any shape or form. The entertainment packages that we've referred to, and I'll turn to some other matters as well, but yes. when you're taking someone, for instance, to the flower drum, as you did in December last year... Uh, that was my staff. It was your staff. You took your staff to the flower drum yes, and as I'm a happy. reward. Is so, that correct? So, Commissioner, if I may just provide some, some context to that. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Host Plus. One of my key roles and functions as a CEO, as a leader, the leader of an organisation, is to assemble a group of highly talented executives who are ultimately the driving room, they are, they, they are the engine room, engine room of Host Plus. When I think about someone like my Chief Investment Officer, Sam Cecilia, now, Sam Cecilia has been with me now for about 10 years. I know Sam gets approached. Sam, to me, is one of the greatest chief investment officers, not only in Australia, in the world. Now, Ian Silk spoke last week about the life-changing impact that funds like Australian Super and Host Plus and many other industry funds have in terms of our ability, sustainability, to deliver extraordinary investment outcomes for our members. Sam Cecilia, to me, is at the epicentre of that. Sam can go off and set up an, his own boutique funds management business 
and I know he's been approached, and he can make a hell of a lot more money, hell of a lot more money than what he is today. When I look at somebody like Umberto Mecchi, my chief marketing officer. Let's not go through the but, entire staff. But, now, let's get to the point. What's so the, the, the point, the, the, point the, the point is, if, if I wish to do something special for them, to make them feel special, to, to effectively retain their loyalty, you know, to, to the fund, then I fundamentally believe that our members are, are better for it. That was a very special night for them, their partners, these guys give me 60, 70 hours every week. They're constantly on call. They deliver great outcomes for my members. And from my, I was given my card by the then CEO in the year 2000. Uh, year 2000. So, um, so the then Chief Executive Officer of Host Plus had, had given me my, uh, my Amex. Um, and the frequent flyer points have always accrued to me and it's been one of my arrangements. Um, have accrued to me as they accrue to any other individual cardholder. And those points are, I mean, the individuals are free to utilise those cards or those points as, as they wish. Uh, but you mentioned before that you've changed the card arrangements now, you're with ME Bank, and that doesn't yeah. have the frequent flyer yeah. loyalty. Yes, th that's right. So as a, as a consequence of the, um, uh, I suppose, uh, the complaint that was made or the whistleblower complaint that was made to APRA, um, the chairman of, of Host Plus and the chairman of the Audit Risk and Compliance Committee um, uh, suggested to me that maybe this is something that we should probably stop and, and I was I agreed to that. And you, you did that because you recognised it was not in the member's best interest that you secure that benefit at the fund's expense? No, it was. it's, it's an entitlement that, that I've had since 2000, you know, since the year 2000, um, it, it's not a secret. I mean, the, the my Amex is actually signed by my chairman and six previous chairmen as well. The points are clearly there. Um, my head of finance, the accounts payable team were aware of that. Uh, I mean, even the whistleblower knew about it. So um, it's not not a, not a secret in in any way. Um, the points are there. You can see the points being transferred. Um, uh, to my, it's a Qantas frequent flyer card, so the points um, had to be linked to the Qantas account. So, um, as I said, this is an arrangement that's been in, had been in practice since since but the card now, was given it's to now me. Ceased. So yes, it's it's, it's it is Thank it is now ceased. It is now ceased. Uh, I just want to tie some points together. So, we know you've got a demographic, or the fund has a demographic that's thirty percent inactive accounts. It's largely a disengaged group. Yes. Uh, That's correct. We've spoke well, about that at the start. Yeah, one of the things that we're we're we're, being, we're trying to to understand is, and there is no. I think you were asked that. Perhaps if you'd ask the question again, so, Ms. Diaz, and if you'd be good enough to answer the question. Yeah, because uh, engagement and inactive is, is slightly two different things. You can be an inactive account balance holder, but still be engaged. Well, I'll put them yep, separately. Sorry, yes. then. Thirty yep. percent inactive accounts, or roughly that. Y yes, thirty yes. percent about inactive Are accounts. Disengaged cohort, young people, disengaged? Uh, potentially, yes. And over 160,000 accounts with a balance below 6,000? Yes. The fund is reliant on their insurance premiums to provide tax deductions that go into the reserve? The fund does receive, we're not reliant on it, but the fund does receive a tax deduction um, at, a, at a fund level. It's not entirely dependent on, on that. Um, as I said, it does receive a tax deduction. Um, but it's certainly not entirely relying on it. And, and again, can I just preface that? The greatest example I can give you of that in relation to the resilience of the fund is during the period from 2005, 2006 through to 2013, when the fund had member protection costs, absorbed member protection costs and continued to do that at the same administration fee level of $78 per member per week, $1.50 per member per week. Um, so there's enormous amount of resilience built built within built within the fund. Uh, the other point that I would make is that well, you're looking at the revenue side of um, the equation. If we lose members, there is a consequential decline in the costs. The way we pay our administrator is also based on a per member fee. So, so th there, there's a consequential offset um, that also would need to, to come into play. Uh, now, Mr Elliot, 
you've suggested that you can't reduce your marketing expenses because you see it as a necessary means to an end to achieve scale. Now, has the fund given proper consideration to alternative means to secure that end? For instance, merger. Um, Host Plus, Host, oh, Host Plus has tried, Host Plus has looked at many merger opportunities and in fact, um, uh, on a confidential basis, I can tell you that we are in discussions with a... It's not confidence. going to be confidential, <laughs> Mr Elliott, yeah. I can assure well, you. <laughs> well, well we, we are. We are in discussions with, with a small fund in our sector. Uh, Host Plus has endeavoured over the years to... Um, we've had numerous merger discussions um, and they fail. They fail for various reasons. Um, we're a sector-specific fund. There are about four or three funds in particular that similarly operate within our sector. And um, uh, certainly from time to time, one of those funds in particular, we've had on and on again and off again. In fact, I'd, I'd argue I've had 20 years worth of discussions with that fund. Okay, no further questions, Commissioner. Yes, Mr Delaney, no, how long would you expect to be? None? No, no. Well, that's a short answer then. Thank you, Mr. Delaney. Uh, Mr. Elliott, thank you very much. You may yes. step down. Thank you. You're excused. Thank you. If we resume at uh, 2 p.m.